haven't checked the weather yet, but I know it is the perfect day to chat about adult Jewish literature. I'm Cheryl Stahl. Thanks for joining me here at Nice Jewish Books. Today, I am excited to welcome Jennifer Rosner. Her latest book, Once We Were Home, has been named as an honor book by the Association of Jewish Libraries Jewish Fiction Award. So welcome, Jennifer, and congratulations on your win. Thank you so much. I'm honored. So I don't generally read Holocaust fiction, but I'm really glad that I did with your book. It covers an area of the Holocaust and the aftermath that has not received a lot of attention. So would you please tell me about Once We Were Home? Sure. Um, Once We Were Home weaves together the stories of four children who are moved under various circumstances from a place of home during World War II. There's There's a sibling pair, Oscar and Anna, who are moved from their family to be harbored with a Polish farm couple during World War II. And then after the war, an operative for the redemption of Jewish children tries to retrieve them and get them en route to Palestine. And Roger is a boy who is harbored by the church for safety. And when surviving Jewish relatives um, seek to reclaim him, the church actually takes him on the run and is trying to keep him within Christianity. And then Renata is a child who was Germanized during the war. And and when the UNRRA tries to repatriate her, her mother actually takes her on, on the road to Oxford. So there are children who are being moved in wartime and their subsequent struggles with a sense of self and identity, belonging, place of home. Yeah, a lot of people think, well, when the war ended, the war ended. But really, it took years, if not decades, or the rest of their life for many people to get settled and, and, you know, as you say, build that identity. That It's really interesting that there's this sort of long adjustment period. And a lot of the people who move children just figured they would settle with whatever situation, you know, they ended up in. But in fact, they struggled quite a quite a lot, uh, many of them. And it, it's been interesting to learn about that. And the age of the children definitely influenced their experience. So the sibling pair, Oscar and Anna, Oscar was very young when he was brought to the Dubrovskis. And you know, of course, he was sad and confused at first, but he pretty quickly adapted and grew to love his his foster parents. But Anna was older and had a lot more memories of her birth family, so it was harder for her to I- accept the situation. Yeah, I purposely gave them different ages, and I wanted to explore the way in which the attachments differed, the sense of loyalty to to their first parents. Anna struggled with becoming comfortable with her foster family because she thought it was something of a betrayal, which I've read a lot about also of her of her original parents, um, what memories they have. And the idea when someone came to reclaim them, Anna remembered her Jewish roots. So the idea of it was somewhat, it was enticing to kind of go back to something, whereas Oscar didn't know anything about it and just felt like he was being uprooted and taken from the only home he knew. And Anna sort of prematurely mature <laughs> in this situation because her birth parents told her, you know, take care of, of Oscar and keep an eye on him. And part of that was not doing a lot of things that little boys do, um, peeing in the meadow, you know, stripping down and jumping in the, the river because that would clearly show, since he'd been circumcised, that he was Jewish. So she felt very responsible for him and either couldn't or wouldn't hand that over to the Dubrovskis to manage, because they were very invested in them, in the community, not knowing these children were Jewish, and said that they were a a niece and nephew whose, whose mother was too ill to take care of them. Yes, and I wanted to um, portray that kind of responsibility on the older children who weren't so old, but had to age quite quickly and become responsible for their younger siblings. And I mean, I think all children 
of war and, you know, particularly here of the Holocaust, you know, they had to grow up so fast because they were hiding and they had to be responsible to not let anything slip. They had to be careful what language they were speaking in. They had to be careful about what they said. They had to remember their fake names. They had a lot of responsibility. They had to, with the siblings, go to church with the family, learn the, the prayers, you know, and really learn their whole backstory. Exactly. Keep up the whole story. So let's move on to Roger. So he had been placed in a convent, and there is very mixed group around him that some of the, the nuns and priests knew that, he, that they were fostering him and that he would be eventually returned to family. Others were really strongly invested in keeping him and, and quote unquote, saving him as a Christian. Yeah. And I think it's really important to also think about the range of how the clergy did handle the rescuing of Jewish children, because there were many clergy who didn't have any intention of taking a Jewish child and making them Christian. They were just trying to harbor them through the war and hope that they would get back to their roots. And then there were some who saw an opportunity and wanted to bring them into the church. And so it did really vary. And I tried to I tried to represent the different kind of thrusts in that kind of situation. And so Sister Brigitte is a person who really supported Roger, trying to help him in whatever way she could to be expressive and, and stay sort of true to himself. But then you even see the complexity in a character like Brother Jacques, who sees his aim at first as saving Roger and keeping him in the church and then eventually coming to understand that perhaps that's not quite uh, the, the right story for Roger. And this story of Roger, I mean, all of the characters in my novel are based on histories, actual histories. And the case of Roger is very loosely built on the case of the Finley brothers. The Finley brothers, Robert and Gerald Finley, were these two boys who were harbored in the church. And then when surviving relatives came to reclaim him, the church took them on the run. And they also baptized him after the war, after relatives sought to claim him. So once he was baptized, they really didn't want to give him back. And there's archival documents showing that, you know, the order to keep him within Christianity went very high up in the papacy. So this was actually built on a true case, as were Oscar Nana and Renata. So um, you know, they're all fictionalized, but they're rooted in histories. So I don't remember hearing about situations like Renata's. Can you talk about that? It's fascinating. There was a huge project that was begun by Himmler to Germanize children who could pass the kind of tests of caliper and eye charts and hair color and stuff and bring these children not they you know they are they were born outside of germany but they might be able to be germanized so they were taken some there's a lot of arguments about how many children but it, it looks like it could be in the hundreds of thousands of children wow and they were taken from various settings from parks from from schools from their parents arms you know they were taken and put into these germanization kind of centers where they would do measurements and if the and and try to see if they could be you know educated re-educated to become german and older children were put into centers and younger children were put into childless german couples homes and a lot of the time the couples didn't understand that those children weren't just children who needed adoption from within germany um they they thought they were just adopting a child and it turned out they were someone else's child that they had been taken and put into their home and um, yeah, and then for the children who didn't pass the Germanization testing, many of the older children were either put into labor camps or they were put into a particular concentration camp and made, only some of the very youngest children were returned. It's mind boggling. And it's also so, I don't wanna say fascinating, that sounds too positive, but bizarre that the Nazis would not accept assimilated Jewish families who were totally assimilated, non-practicing Jews, you know, looked like the other Germans around them, but they would accept 
these random children. Yeah, and I should say most of the children they accepted, you know, were from Poland and other nearby countries. Most of them weren't Jewish children. Um, I don't know of Jewish children, but I think maybe um, some, but mostly not. And oh, okay. But but I think the idea was that the birth rate in Germany was very low. The soldier, the men were off, off at war. They were trying to bolster the population. But what's really bizarre to me is that for a people who was, you know, for a group that were so focused on racial purity, the idea that you could grab children from any random place, Slavic children, who they ordinarily looked down on, but if they passed these certain kinds of tests, they could be kind of, you know, educated and put in. It was very interesting and, and very strange. I want to go back to the siblings when the organization i'm sorry i don't remember the name the jewish organization Koordinatia. well there were many organizations who were seeking to get these children back into judaism but there was sort of this umbrella group called Koordinatia. they were trying to organize the different players and work together to try to reclaim as many jewish children as possible so it was definitely not a smooth journey from once they found and got the children to finding family or to relocating them to Israel. No. And here's the thing. Most of those children didn't have parents. Like the parents had perished. They were hidden with these, you know, Christian couples or families. So they weren't going to be going home, you know, they weren't going back to family, they were going to Judaism. And that's where for me, the kind of moral blurriness of it came in, because you're taking a child who has had so many ruptures, they lost their first family, they were placed in a second home to try to be, you know, rescued during the war. And now the war ends, and they're taken again to be returned to their to, to Judaism, but that might mean a Jewish orphanage, or it might mean a kibbutz, but it doesn't mean you're going home. And it was really complicated because the people who were doing this work were mostly Holocaust survivors. They had lost everyone, you know, in their families, in their villages. And to think of leaving Jewish children behind was very painful. And after such annihilation, they were trying to rebuild the collective and it felt like a moral imperative to do so. I think it also felt scary to leave them in Polish settings in particular because anti-Semitism was so rampant just after the war, even as much as during. And so I think they felt a kind of personal responsibility that if they knew there were Jewish children hiding, they should get them back and get them out of there. Because even if the family was loving and accepting, there were neighbors, there were villagers, there were other people, and it felt very dangerous. And I should say thirdly, that something that was pressing on the operatives was a kind of sense of honoring the last wishes of the parents who perished. So, you know, the parents put their children in this Christian setting, not so that they would be raised Christian, but that so that they could just be on hold and safe until they could come back and raise them Jewish. And so the idea here is that the operatives would get those children back and raise them Jewish, and it would be a way of honoring the parents who perished. So all these factors were in their minds. But for me, the idea of taking a child out of a home that they might love, you know, the parents and feel connected and feel, you know, safe to move them for the sake of, you know, their Judaism was complex and kind of morally blurry to me. Whereas, you know, some of the operatives saw it as saving, but there was actually some disagreement about, you know, even what you call this type of of mission. So sometimes, you know, they would say rescue, but then others would say, no, the Christian family who's harboring them were the rescuers. And so they'd say, well, we're redeeming them or we're reclaiming them or we're retrieving them. And some said we're ransoming them because they were offering money. So there was definitely like, even within the conversation, you could feel the moral texture there. Yeah. And even later in life, Oscar wanted to continue that relationship with the Dabrowskis, he considered them his parents and, you know, started writing letters to them and eventually visited them. And Anna was very reluctant to do that. She was like, nope, those weren't my parents. <laughs> Done with that, not going to think about them. 
Yeah. And again, it sort of represents the range of how people dealt with all these different kind of circumstances that were very tough in wartime and how they emotionally managed um, going forward. And that's the same, you know, same with not just the relationships to people, but even to their faiths. So, you know, you might ensconce yourself in Judaism after all that, or you might hold on to Christianity after that, or, you know, there were so many different ways children who were emerging from the situation were coping with the situation. Oscar and Anna ended up eventually on a kibbutz. Oscar left somewhat early, but Anna settled down, and in many ways, she was philosophically very in tune with the the kibbutz and egalitarianism, and you know everyone everyone being equal and no shared property, until she married and had a child, and then it was very difficult for her to only see her kid during appointed hours during the week because they were in the the baby house and, you know, she could take a work shift there, but basically she could not see her child as much as she wanted. And it seems like that would be very much influenced by the fact that she had been taken from her parents and then taken from her foster parents. And, you know, she wanted to have be able to provide a a close childhood that she didn't have. Yes, I think that the feeling that in her mind, her first, her parents, her mother in particular, left her with the other, you know, with the Dabrowskis. And then she was taken from the Dabrowskis and brought, you know, on this, on this journey, etc. It was as if, you know, she hadn't been held on to and she wanted to hold on to her child. And, and I think it pressed very hard, that kind of very strict communal aspect of the kibbutz, especially at that early stage of, of kibbutz development. Um, nowadays, I think it's different. I think children can sleep with their parents, you know, in their, in their house on the kibbutz. But it, early on, you know, the children were parented by whoever was on duty in the child room. I'd like to ask you about the title. And it seems that once we were home could be understood in two ways, or at least two ways. <laughs> it could be that we used to be home and we're not anymore, or it could be the beginning of a new phrase or phase. Once we were home, we were able to dot, 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 start a new life. We were able to reconnect with Judaism. Uh, what, what were your thoughts on the title? Well, I purposely chose it for the ambiguity because I feel like every child will have, who has experienced this kind of rupture, will have a different take on the nature of home as the, and maybe it changes over the course of their life as well. And so I really wanted it to be unclear. And that's why I love that word once in our language. And the only complication is as it gets translated into foreign um, <laughs> languages that there may not be that dual meaning, but I really feel it's important. So it sounded like you did quite a bit of research. So I was wondering how you found these sort of case studies to base your characters on. Yeah, well, this novel began when I met a woman who actually worked as what they called an operative for the redemption of Jewish children. So, you know, this Holocaust. Holocaust survivor who I met who um, she had been in a Siberian labor camp during the war. She returned to her native Poland afterwards and learned that just something like 3% of Jewish children had survived and they were in, you know, Christian settings with assumed identities and names, et cetera. And um, she ended up joining a mission to try to reclaim those children. And she described her work and how they went about it, that she said they would go into taverns, they would try to buy drinks, they would loosen lips and see if, you know, any children arrived during wartime. So she was in there in 1946, you know, asking if any children arrived in wartime. And if a child arrived in 42, right around when ghettos were being liquidated, there's a good chance that the parents had, you know, desperately found, you know, a housing situation for their child. And so even if someone said, my nephew and niece are here with me during the war, there's a chance that that was a Jewish child in hiding. And so they would go with money and try to, um, 
you know, offer money to, to get the children back. And, you know, a lot of these families were incredibly poor. They were stretching as far as they could to have, you know, feed this extra mouth. And even when they very much loved this child, sometimes they would take the money and give the child. Other times they didn't want to. And this woman, you know, said that they wanted those children and they were going to try to get them no matter how it went and you know even if it meant at dusk kind of throwing them over your shoulder and running so um you know it was they were desperate to get them and they felt it was their moral imperative to do so so she described that and i really couldn't stop thinking about that it it batted around in my head for a long time and and that was you know the beginning of of fleshing out the oscar and anna storyline of of children in a setting like that and being moved and what that must feel like and um you know how what the child must struggle with on 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 many many levels and your character Ava who is the one trying to to reclaim the children went through a lot of different phases in her life about when she was looking back about the work that she did and sometimes wondered if maybe it wasn't the best choice yeah and so it's interesting because the operative that I met did not have much retrospective regret or or concern. She felt she had saved the children, saved Judaism. She, you know, she she felt um, it was pretty clear to her. But I read the testimonies of other operatives who followed many of the children they moved, and they recognized that there was some psychic damage caused by that last that next rupture. You know, that they were ensconced in this other family, and that taking them out caused a lot of of, of of anxiety or 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 just a lot of difficulty and um and so they wondered child by child like maybe overarchingly it was the right thing to do but maybe there were particular cases in which they should have left the child there or you know they just wondered was it the right thing we didn't talk much about renata who as you said was a, probably a polish or slavic baby who is placed with a, a german family and her mother absolutely refused to speak about her past, about family. She was always very secretive with Renata. And Renata, ironically, or maybe because of that, um, became an archaeologist, so someone who was really intent on digging up secrets and examining the past. Exactly. So she's examining everyone's past except her own because she doesn't really have a lot of access to it. And and in the novel, um, you know, you start seeing that what has happened to Renata is a lot of stuff she doesn't remember. And so, in fact, her storyline is to some extent narrated by her little Matryoshka doll who she's holding in her hand at the time the Nazi soldiers take her and she has with her through her journey. And because there are things she can't remember, but I want the reader to know, there are little interstitial chapters where the Matryoshka doll narrates and so you understand what has happened to Renata, even though she doesn't know. And ultimately, when her mom dies and there's going to be, um, you know, a box, a lot of boxes to go through, she will probably she will learn. But I thought it was really interesting to build a character who doesn't know a lot about her past. So the other kids, you know, they grow up sort of in front of you, knowing what's happening to them, whereas Renata's past is is obscured to her. And there really are a lot of people who don't know what happened in the early days. So I had watched a documentary about Germanization and I had seen this sibling pair who only learned that they were German in their like late 70s, early 80s. They had thought they were German their whole lives, but in fact, they had been moved as very young children as part of Germanization. And um, it was I'm shocking. Sorry. You said they only learned they were German. I'm so sorry. Um, they only learned that they were actually not German, <laughs> um, it, you know, quite late in the in the game. And the brother was very eager to kind of go back to his village. I believe it was Poland and, um, you know, ask neighbors, see if anyone remembered his family, you know, try to find out as much as he could about his roots. And his sister just refused. And she was like, no, I'm German. I'm not going, you know, she just didn't want to engage with that sort of new identity or new information about her identity. And um, I just thought it was interesting that, you know, a lot of children of war, especially very young ones who are moved around, may be missing pieces of the story 
and may or may not ever learn them. I mean, these days we have DNA testing and we have other methods for learning things, but, um, you know, this relatively new and, you know, there are plenty of people whose histories have just remained a mystery. Mm -hmm. So was there anything in your research that surprised you? I mean, honestly, everything surprised me. I, I was very surprised to know that there was this mission to try to get children who were, you know, hit, still hiding in Christian settings and get them back to Judaism. I didn't know about that mission at all. And I had been pretty steeped in Holocaust history because I had written a previous novel, The Yellow Bird Sings. Mm -hmm. But when I met this woman, I learned of this whole kind of side of it, of after the war and the attempt to reclaim the children for Judaism. And then, honestly, I started opening things up and I learned about the Finley brothers and saw that this was happening also by the church, that they were trying to keep children in the church. And then, you know, learning about Germanization was also kind of an eye opening thing. And I think the takeaway for me was that we do this. We move children around. It happens under so many different circumstances. I mean, especially in wartime, but you see it now with Russian soldiers taking Ukrainian children, but you can also go back to Argentina and in Yemen and Chile, and there's all these cases, I mean, cases of children being moved. And for some, you know, ideological reasons, which I'm not going to pass judgment on, but for some adult conception of where a child belongs, a child is moved from possibly a place of love and moved into another place, may or may not be a place of love. Um, but it was just to me really interesting to think about and to realize and it wasn't just one group of people. It is all of us, because <laughs> when you look at the history, it's just a rampant thing and it's very disturbing. And in fact, you know, I could have chosen to just write the Oscar and Honest story, but it, but I didn't want to do that because it's not only Jews who were, who went back and reclaimed children. Right. It's it was happening kind of in this. Um, you know, on, on many levels and, you know, sort of on under different conditions. And I guess it's really important to me to say that I don't draw equivalencies at all between the cases like Jews after the Holocaust trying to reclaim Jewish children is not at all like Nazis taking children from Polish families and, you know, trying to Germanize them like they're not the same in any way. However, the commonality here is the children themselves and the struggles they face because my four children, however different their circumstances were, are all struggling with their sense of self and how to connect to others and what is home and, and where do I belong. Uh, do you have any projects in the works that you would like to mention? I am working on a new novel. It's at the very beginning. It's about a young girl who wakes up after having a illness and a high fever and she can't hear. It's really about a journey she takes sort of through through the deaf capital D and lowercase d deaf worlds of, you know, um, and, and trying to explore the kind of fractiousness in in those worlds and looking at that as a possible microcosm into like the larger fractiousness of our of our situation today. And, you know, my daughters are both deaf and I've kind of over my, the course of my writing life have kind of um, been, you know, dealing with deafness in different ways on the page as well as in our life and decided I really wanted to explore this in a way that showed all sides of the debates in a way that wasn't biased and really kind of I don't know, like let the hearing world into the mindsets because they all have some validity and they're all a bit crazy in certain ways. And like everything, you know, there's a range and a, a big array. And I think, I hope it'll be interesting. It sounds wonderful. And you did include a deaf character in this book as well. So a, a kid grew into a young man who, who was Oscar's best friend was deaf. And they talked about learning sign language and learning how to communicate with him. Yes, he's in there and uh, he's one of my favorites. <laughs> yeah. uh, my last question is always, if you would like to take a minute to promote some call to action for Tikkun Olam, for repairing the world, what would it be? Yeah, um, our world is in need of repair on so many levels. And I was thinking, 
that maybe the best call is that if you're not acting to act and if you're acting a little act more <laughs> because we need you know we just need everyone engaged and you know um in our family we're working right now on voter protection so that you know as the election comes forward that people's votes will be they that people won't be disenfranchised in voting um that's just one aspect of so many issues but i think given that you know the book i've written about children in wartime you know fighting for peace <laughs> in whatever way we can get it is really so primary and i hope that people will do everything they can to to try to promote peace yeah, as we're recording this, the war in Gaza has been going on for five months now, and you definitely need more more peace in that area. And for those uh, children and other hostages to be redeemed and reclaimed and sent home. Exactly. So if someone would like to contact you, what is the best way? Um, my website has a contact email um, that you can just go right on the site and get. And my website is um, is www.jennifer-rosner.com. Had to add that dash uh, between the two R's. <laughs> and um, yeah, that's probably the best way because you can also see if I'm having an event nearby or if you would like to ask your, you know, ask me to join in your book club or all kinds of things there. Wonderful. Well, Jennifer Rosner, thank you so much for speaking to me about Once We Were Home. Thank you so much for having me. If you are interested in any of the books we discussed today, you can find them at your favorite board and brick or online bookstore or at your local library. Thanks to Dianke for use of his Freilich, which definitely makes me happy. This podcast is a project of the Association of Jewish Libraries, and you can find more about it at www.jewishlibraries.org slash nicejewishbooks. I would like to thank AJL and my podcast mentor, Heidi Rabinowitz. Keep listening for the promo for her latest episode. Hi everyone, I'm Martin Lemmelman, the author and illustrator of The Miracle Seed. I'm thrilled to be able to join Heidi in the upcoming Book of Life podcast. I'd like to dedicate my episode to two amazing Israeli women, Dr. Sarah Salon of Hadassah Hospital and Dr. Elaine Salaway of the Arabah Institute. They created the miracle in my book. For more than 1,000 years, the Judean date palm was extinct. Working with ancient seeds discovered on the fortress of Matsada, they brought this special tree back to life. The Book of Life is the sister podcast of Nice Jewish Books. I'm your host, Heidi Rabinowitz, and I podcast about Jewish kid lit. Join me to hear my conversation with Martin Lemelman about the Miracle Seed at bookoflifepodcast.com. dot